Now I'd like to share about the Lord's Supper. Um, the Lord Jesus, when he was, um, uh, before he was crucified, he instituted the Lord's Supper. And there, there aren't that many rituals that the Lord Jesus told the disciples to do. And there aren't that many things, really specific things and activities um, that we do at a church that are quite as specifically laid out as the Lord's Supper. Now, Jesus did tell the disciples to, to uh, baptize. He t baptized. He told them to love one another. He didn't give a lot of details about how they were to sing their songs or um, some of those things, but he did tell them this about the Lord's Supper to uh, how to remember him. Um, let's look at uh, Luke 21, uh, verse 15. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is body uh, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup um, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and say, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Um, so, <clears throat> we see that, uh, that Christ um, instituted this remembrance of him through bread and the cup uh, during a meal. They're eating an actual meal. And from what I've read, the early church had an agape meal, an actual meal that they would have. And part of it was remembering the Lord through the bread and the wine. And <clears throat> the cup, in this case, in the, in the practice of Jesus here in, in uh, Luke chapter 22, was Jesus took the cup um, after the meal and said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. So that was the last thing they did for the meal. And the, during the meal, or perhaps towards the end of it, he broke bread. And they'd probably broken other bread, but this one bread that they broke was uh, to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, we see that this is a tradition that is passed down to the churches to participate in. Um, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul refers to uh, remembering the Lord in this way as the Lord's Supper, but the Corinthians were doing this so poorly that it, they were eating their own supper and weren't eating the Lord's Supper. They weren't doing it to remember the Lord. They were doing it for their own benefit. So, um, but the word, uh, I looked up the Greek word for supper, and indeed it means supper, a meal uh, eaten towards the end of the day. Now, I've, I've written a little bit more about this in my book, if anybody uh, has an opportunity to uh, read it. Um, <clears throat> let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Uh, I'm going to read through the passage, I'm using the NIV. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, partake, partaking of the supper wrongly can do more harm than good, actually. So we need to make sure we do it right. We do need to partake of it because the Lord Jesus commanded, do this in remembrance of me. Verse 18, in the first place, I hear that when you come together, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For each, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. <clears throat> Don't you have homes to eat in, eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the, the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore... Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be gu guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. 
For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgments, judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we, have, if we judge ourselves, if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we sh will not be condemned with the world. So then, brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that, we, so that when you meet together, it may be, not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further instructions. So <clears throat> this is kind of a, this is a correcting passage on how to do the Lord's Supper. The Corinthians weren't waiting for each other. And if you think about how it was back then, not many wise men after the flesh were called, Paul says. We know that there were a number of Christians in the early centuries who were slaves, there were widows, there were poor people. And there were some that were probably okay financially and had good jobs or businesses or whatever. But <clears throat> Paul asks if they, if they uh, <clears throat> despise the church of God and humili <clears throat> humiliate those who have nothing. Uh, perhaps the ones who had nothing were coming later to the meeting, or perhaps when they ate, some people would just go to the table and eat all the food up and, not, and bring their own food and not share food with the poor. So what Paul's wanting to do is he wants them to tarry, to wait for each other. Uh, ways that we can wait for each other is if, if there are poor people, for example, the slaves uh, had, to work, had to take care of things at home, and then they'd come in really late to the meeting. This was an age before the clock had been invented. Um, they'd come back, come to the meeting really late, and all the food was gone, and there was no bread and no wine to remember the Lord Jesus with. Um, the other people had eaten it up. That's a very bad thing. The church should wait for them to arrive. Another thing is, they could have waited until everyone had their portion of food before they ate. Uh, many house churches in the United States um, notice that the New Testament teaches an actual meal, the Lord's Supper, and emphasize greatly having a meal. But we need to be careful, too, that uh, the meal doesn't become, uh, when you get together with a group of people who cook good food, oh, you, you're happy to eat that food. And there can be an emphasis on, uh, or people can become gluttonous or eat too much or the, the, they focus more on the food than on remembering the body and, and blood of the Lord. But this is a serious event. It doesn't, Paul doesn't specify that you have to have other kinds of food, that you have to have um, something besides bread and wine. Uh, but he doesn't forbid it either. And in the example of Jesus, we know they had some other food besides bread and wine. For one thing, it was the Passover, and it was the tradition to eat, the lamb, eat a lamb and to eat the whole thing. But also we know that there was some bread dip because they dipped their, uh, Judas dipped his, his bread in the dip at the gathering uh, um, that evening. So, uh, but when they remembered the Lord, they took the loaf and they broke it, and they, there was a cup. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't think we should condemn anybody for just having the bread and only having wine and, and not having other food there as well to make it a more complete meal. But uh, we don't have to do the tiny wafers. If you have, a, you know, a loaf of bread, they probably used a big flat round loaf of bread like you see in some Middle Eastern countries back then and, and tore it and shared, among, shared that loaf among the people. And, and you can also follow the example of the apostles where the people would eat together. And if you have somebody who's not baptized, you let them eat a meal with you. Uh, but then when you remember the Lord, uh, if you have somebody there who's not a believer, who's not part of the fellowship, and you haven't accepted in, and, and the reason I say not baptized is because if someone is a, a disciple of Christ, they should be baptized. And if they're uh, not a disciple, they're not ready to make the commitment, then they, you know, they shouldn't be baptized yet. So if they, if they haven't put their faith in Christ yet. And so that's, I think that tradition of having baptized people participate in communion makes sense because... In the pattern of the New Testament, those who believe are baptized, and then they can partake of communion. And it makes perfect sense to me. That's a, an ancient tradition in the church to do it that way. So if you have somebody there who's considering Christianity but not ready, and you have them in your house, and <clears throat> you have a meeting, and you want to feed him, you can feed him, but when the, when the time comes to remember the Lord, you can say, you know, this, this is for only people who are part of the body of Christ, who, who are uh, accepted in. Now, um, <clears throat> there's a danger here if uh, we don't regard the Lord's body when we partake of communion. And the way the Corinthians were doing it is they were not sharing the communion with the poor people. Perhaps these were poor people who came in later because they're poor slaves or they, they, you know, they, have, they have to things to do and they come in very late to the church meeting and the food's all gone. And they're not sharing, the, the, the congregation is not sharing the bread and the cup 
with them. So these people are excluded, but they're members of the body of Christ. And by not being allowed to partake of the bread, uh, which Jesus says the bread is his body, they are being excluded. Now, an interesting thing to, to learn about the bread and the cup and, and the importance of communion is to look in first, an interesting way to learn that is to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here, Paul is trying to exhort the Corinthians not to participate in communion and also uh, eat food offered to idols, but he teaches some interesting things about the uh, communion in the process. In verse 16 of chapter 10, 1 Corinthians 10, it says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. So we see here that the, uh, <clears throat> the cup of thanksgiving um, is uh, fellowship with the body of Christ. The word is the Greek word is koinonia. So we have oneness, fellowship, participation in Christ's body when we partake of the bread, and when we, I'm sorry that when in Christ's blood when we partake of the cup, and then it continues on when we partake of the bread, we have fellowship or communion or oneness or unity with that uh, the, with the body of Christ. So because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. So I, I recommend. Uh, using one loaf of bread for, to remember the Lord's body, if you can, especially so it works out well in a in a house group. But that's not the only food you have to eat together. But um, you can do that at this part at the end of the meal, this when they had the cup in Christ's example. So we can you can eat and then remember the Lord. And this is a, a solemn occasion. It's a time to, or it's a serious occasion, a time to remember the Lord. So because uh, there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. In my country, there's a saying, you are what you eat. And usually people use that to refer to health. You know, if you eat healthy food, you'll be healthy. But here, uh, we are all part of a loaf of bread because we all um, partake of one loaf of bread. Here we are what we eat in a spiritual sense. We eat the body of Christ by eating the bread. And so we are all part of the body of Christ. And we are all one loaf of bread. So the Bible, this, this book teaches us that we are one bread. It also teaches us in 1 Corinthians 12, that uh, we are the body of Christ. He says, you're the body of Christ. Um, and members in particular. I don't see the exact verse. But it's in 1 Corinthians 12. For you're the body of Christ and members in particular. And we see uh, this is only a few verses away from the instructions in chapter 11 about not regarding the Lord's body. So when the Corinthians were eating the bread, and the bread is the body of Christ. They are the body of Christ. And they're not regarding the other people who are the body of Christ when they're eating this bread. It's a sin against the Lord's body. And they're sinning against the Lord's body by separating these people who are, who, who are poor, who are not eating with them from the body by not eating with them. So <clears throat> we need to be careful about that. Um, if you have somebody who comes, who has to watch his ailing sick mother and comes to your meeting really late and you've eaten up all the Lord's Supper and then you don't share any with that person, well, this is a passage to consider as well. Uh, there in, So we need to be very careful that we don't exclude people from the Lord's Supper. Uh, another passage of Scripture that I think of when I, when I say such things is, um, <clears throat> if you'll remember in Galatians that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, when uh, Paul rebuked Peter, he says um, Peter had stopped uh, eating with the Gentiles. When the uh, people from Jerusalem came, certain men came from James, Peter probably felt really uncomfortable eating with Gentiles. It was a Jewish tradition for the very religious Orthodox Jews not and, and that lived in Judea not to eat with Gentiles. Now some of the Jews who lived in the Greek areas were probably a little looser or had different interpretations, but the Judean Jews, many of them were very uncomfortable with eating with Gentiles. So when some Judean Jews came up from um, Jerusalem, Peter felt uncomfortable eating with the Gentiles and he stopped. So if we read in Galatians 2, 11 through 13, but when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but they went, when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, 
fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews likewise dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So uh, P Peter and Barnabas uh, stopped eating with the Gentiles when the more um, conservative Jewish people came around from Jerusalem. And this was wrong, and I, I suspect that their eating together may have been the Lord's Supper because Jesus said that Jesus left the disciples with this tradition of eating together and remembering his death. And we read in Acts that they uh, continued in the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread and prayer. So I believe that they would regularly eat bread and pass around the cup and remember the Lord Jesus Christ in that way. And so when they go to Antioch, they do the same thing. They're known for having this love feast. Every, you know, they, the church for them was gathering in a home and um, you know, sharing the word of God and also eating and remembering Jesus by doing so. And so um, I'm inferring, perhaps in Galatians 2, they're eating the Lord's Supper, and then when the Jews come, uh, some more conservative Jews come in, Peter and uh, Barnabas stop, and then various other Jewish people stop eating with the Gentiles, which creates a division. If this is the Lord's Supper, it creates a division in the Lord's Supper, and is a very serious matter. So no wonder Paul would rebuke Peter about it. If you'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, because the church was not regarding the Lord's body by this division that they were having in their supper. It says in verse 30, That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. So it's very important for us not to have division in the Lord's Supper that separates the body of Christ. But at the, on the other hand, uh, we can be too liberal in who we allow to participate in the Lord's Supper. You know, the Lord's Supper is fellowship with the body of Christ. Uh, but also in Jude chapter 12, we read about false brethren who come into the church. And should they partake of the Lord's Supper? Let's look at verse 12. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown, among, uh, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted twice dead. Now, <clears throat> some Bible scholars believe that uh, the love feast is the Lord's Supper or that it is a portion of the Lord's Supper, that what we refer to the Lord's Supper is the, or the Eucharist that occurs at the Lord's Supper, the, Thanksgiving, the cup of thanksgiving and the bread that we share. So um, I, I believe that the Lord's Supper is the same thing as the love feasts, and these men are blemishes at your love feasts. Um, 2 Peter 2.12 speaks of false teachers and says they are spots and blemishes while they feast with you. So they're are their spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. So here uh, Jude calls, calls false brethren blemishes and says that they're blemishes at your love feasts. And, and Peter, in Second Peter chapter 2, a very similar parallel passage, calls false teachers spots and blemishes and says that they feast with you. So I believe what these two passages taken together are saying is that false teachers and false brethren are spots and blemishes and that uh, they are spots and blemishes on our communion, on love feasts, if we allow it. And a, uh, when you think about a spot and a blemish, if you read, uh, Paul, uh, Peter makes a statement that Christ was the lamb without spot or blemish. And if you read in the Old Testament, a, a Passover lamb or any kind of lamb for sacrifice is not allowed to have a spot or a blemish. The lamb, the sacrificial lamb, is a type of Christ. It points forward to Jesus Christ dying uh, on the cross. Uh, John the Baptist said of Jesus in, in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God. So by allowing uh, wicked men who are uh, false teachers who lead people into sin um, to participate in the Lord's Supper, the, this, this was a bad thing, and it was like a spot or a blemish, like a sacrifice that was not acceptable to God in the Old Testament. So this is a serious thing as well. Um, also, if you'll compare in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, um, <clears throat> when there was a man in the body who was a, um, well, there was a man in their church who was sleeping with his father's wife. Um, he was fornicating with his father's wife. We read that in verse um, 5, Hand this man over to Satan so that the flesh may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, that ye may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old yeast, 
the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with, the bre but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. So this is a very Passover, um, this is a thick and Passover metaphors of not having yeast in the bread, which was a required of Passover of the Jews. And then he writes um, in verse 11, but now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat. So we're not allowed to eat with this kind of a person who calls himself a Christian, who calls himself a brother. Uh, we're supposed to expel such people from among ourselves. And if we're not allowed to eat with them, we're certainly not allowed to eat the Lord's Supper with them, especially when we're uh, warned that spots and blemishes, um, that there can be spots and blemishes on our love feasts. So um, <clears throat> those are some of the teachings I'd like to share about the Lord's Supper. The, um, it's, the Lord's Supper is a time, you know, we have a, a warning here that those who did not regard the Lord's body, uh, some of them were sick and some of them were asleep. They had died physically because they did not properly regard the Lord's body. And they were doing that by not properly regarding other people while they're participating in the Lord's Supper. And I believe, you know, if you, we consider what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Um, in Matthew 5, <clears throat> we read, let's, let's look here. Um, that if someone has something against us, I mean, Oh, this mark. No wonder I can't find it. Okay. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 21 and the verses that follow. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be sub subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But he who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering a gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So, we read here in this passage that if you are, that we need to remember what the altar was. It was a place in the temple where they offered gifts. On the altar, um, they would also offer animal, they would offer animal sacrifices. Let's imagine you have a goat on a leash and you're in the temple. You have a goat without a spot or a blemish and you want to sacrifice it to God. And Jesus was just telling the people, leave that goat, leave it there go away and make it right with the person that uh, has something against you, the person that you offended, the person that you sinned against or that you spoke against. So make things right with the person before you offer your gift to the Lord. And I believe we should have a similar attitude about communion. If you have uh, bitter feelings towards other people, if you've sinned against somebody and you haven't uh, asked forgiveness, if you've cheated someone and you've not restored to them and made restitution and made things right between you and that person, Go take care of that before you go to communion, before you uh, fellowship with other members of the body of Christ through the communion. You know, a little bit of leaven can spread throughout the whole lump of dough, and we don't, you don't want to contaminate other people with your sin, and what you, but you want to live according to what Jesus said and make things right with other people. So before we participate in communion, we need to make things right with our brothers. We need to make peace with one another. And this is a way we participate in communion regularly. This is a motivation for making, keeping things right between us. I remember one time I was getting ready to go to a, a meeting and I knew we would be having, it was a house church meeting with my wife in a car and I knew we would be having uh, communion. And for some reason, my wife and I were arguing in the car on the way to church. And I don't remember what we were arguing about, but we, you know, I could tell there were some ill feelings and we were, we would be late if I did this, but I pulled over on the side of the road and I said, honey, I want us to not to go to church be angry and then go into the church and then and the church meeting and then uh, partake of communion when we're angry at each other. So why don't we wait here and until we until we both calm until you calm down or until we both calm down and then we can make up and we can be right with one another before we go participate in communion. And I think that uh, communicated a good message to my wife and and we made up and then we went into the church. So.
um, that that's a good thing if we can keep those relationships with other people right. And communion is a way, especially with the warnings, you know, we want to regard one another properly. We want to be in good relationship with one another. We want to have our, uh, we, we, we do, we have our sins forgiven through Christ Jesus, but we need to obey what Jesus said, and we need, need to make things right with other people. If our heart is right before God, then we're going to love the brethren. We're going to do things right with other people. So that's how we know we pass from love, from death to life, is we love the brethren. Well, if we love the brethren, we're going to make things right with other people. And we need to make things right with believers and with people who are on the outside. And that is a good testimony of the grace of God if you go and you make things right with other people uh, who are not believers so that they can see the fruit of God in your life and also so you can obey Jesus and, and have a good relationship with him. Thank you very much for watching this video about uh, communion and various other topics. I hope it's been a blessing to you.